Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Nature Folklore Sessions. It's 21st of November 2021. Well, thank you all for joining me. It's a lovely sunny day here at Karakrori, and it's our weekly time of exploring nature-centered folklore, connecting this to your favorite sanctuary space, and expressing inspired visions from your sanctuary through your poetry, writing, arts, crafts, performance, and problem solving. Now, this afternoon's theme is part two of a three-part series on barding. And today, we're going to focus on putting our words with sound. And I'm going to be using the music from harps as our main example. And for that, we've got a uh, guest today is uh, Claire Roach. She's brought two harps along today, which is fantastic. And she's actually in the studio, which is unique. And these uh, folklore, nature folklore sessions, as usual, uh, and the Karakori Labyrinth Garden still, are brought to you, all thanks to you Patreon subscribers. And I know some of you subscribers are watching here today. So thank you very much for your continued support because without it, I wouldn't be able to be here hosting this for you this afternoon. So let's uh, see who's uh, joining in as early birds today. Uh, lovely to have you live. Uh, it looks like we don't actually have anyone <laughs> yet. So uh, I trust that people will be coming on, and I have gone live because I know sometimes I make a mistake. Uh so well, I hope people are logging on. So never mind, we'll catch, we'll see what's happening. Uh, so today I'm going to actually start by uh, sharing a few lovely ancient Harper Bard stories to set the scene of uh, this enchanting Bard tradition. Uh, nice to see you, Gary. Uh, so it's good to see that we're live. As I say, slow start today. And uh, I'm going to ha later hand you over to uh, Claire Roach. Oh, Sherry's uh, joined on, which is fantastic. Uh, and as I say, we're going to have Claire. And there's her in the Bluebell Woods. And she seems to have un unknowingly adopted the she-gifted, as I say, the she-gifted ancient tradition through the creation and sharing of her songs. And we'll be interviewing and hearing from Claire and putting all that together. And there's a few men that actually do this today. It's not something that women do very much. Uh, Robin Williamson has been doing it for years, just, and this is a recent photo of him. And Nick Hennessy uh, is a lovely one uh, from Cumbria who does this as well. But there's hardly any women that do this. Uh, there's a Scotswoman, Fiona Davidson, who used to, and uh, beautifully, and she's supposed to have a picture come up, but there we go. That's Fiona Davidson. And there's also Tara Jaff, who beautifully shares Kurdic tales in her own Kurdic language. But uh, with Claire Roach, uh, she's an actual. Uh, a lot of you will be familiar with her, and you're in for a treat uh, very soon. But I'm going to start with uh, the earliest that I know of, en of enchanting uh, harp stories, that I've heard, and this is of uh, Canna Clovemore, or Canola, some people call her, and I, I've got a sort of artist impression of her. This is her here, and um, Goddess of the Sea, and the story tells there was a time where she was uh, resting on the seashore, came out of the sea, and uh, she heard some uh, sweet music, and what was that sweet music? And she discovered it was wind blowing through the rib bones of a beached whale, and um, there we go. There's a beached whale there and the skeleton. And from there, the stories tell of Kanaklovmo building a harp uh, from Beechwood and then got sinews from a uh, beached whale. I heard another story of this saying it was dolphins. And it, uh, this is an artist's impression, very flash of how that harp came out. Anyway, uh, it's wonderful where the imagination goes, isn't it? Anyway. And this was a structure, an uh, angular harp uh, that was copied for use of anyone in Aryan area that may have been enchanted with the calling of music for their words, and they can put a harp together, though, as you'll see from pictures later on, it was a much more simpler structure than that. But anyway, uh, Kanakovmore became known as the goddess of dreaming, inspiration, and music, and there's not really a person that's heard of more. So 
very few storytellers talk about her, but the, there is a similar story that's very well told, uh, the story of Kian and the wooing of Ethna, the daughter of Bala. And it was McMahon and McGlur who actually brought Ethna from um, Tory Island uh, quietly across the sea, brought to Kian, who was actually on the beach of uh, Magara uh, near Adra. Um, I think I, what I'm going to do there, I'm going to swap over to a, um, a back screen, uh, which uh, we'll, we'll get into the Magara's uh, mode right now because uh, I've got uh, I got a back screen there just to show you where it is. I thought I had one. There it is, uh, that beautiful beach. And here's where the harp story seems to take off a bit uh, with the wooing of Ethna. And they both became future parents of the very famous Lou of Long Arm of the Tour de Donnan. And as I say, that was after McGlur, God of the Sea, had brought Ethna from uh, Tory Island there. And uh, if you've been to our draw and you go past the wonderful waterfall, I've, which uh, the name escapes me. It's a beautiful name as it is. And you'll get to the Magara Beach, which has got the famous caves. But there was a whale there. Anyway, Kian was uh, walking on the beach. And there we go, rib bones again. And he walked up to the skeleton of this uh, perished whale. And he started playing a tune uh, on this whale's rib bones. And uh, it was an enchanting tune. And uh, if uh, kind of affected... Ethna, and from that moment, Ethna declared her love for and passion for Kian. And after the mating, very soon after, Lou the Long Arm was born. Anyway, a few of us, a uh, few people have joined us since, which is lovely to see. And I, before I get on to the next story here, good morning from Pennsylvania. We got um, uh, Anne Boldling here. Fantastic. Sharon Nichols uh, turned up. And uh, Sharon's saying hello. Uh, there we go. We got to say hello. And there we go. Uh, the problem with people logging on could be that Nature Folklore FB page isn't going live and not allowing me to click on it. Uh, very strange. I uh, saw you live through the FB notification. I don't know why they're sluggish on that. Uh, it should go on uh, straight away. But anyway, I don't think you missed much. And uh, obviously, there is the archive later on. I've just been telling a little story of uh, perhaps the earliest origins to the folklore uh, that's coming over. I haven't missed anyone, have I? Donna Johnson saying good morning. Someone's watching from Bray here. Oh, that's Gary who's watching from Bray. He's going up the head shortly. Uh, great. Uh, yes, fantastic day for that. Anyway, on to uh, we got um, the next one really is we're going on to Doida really um, because Kian, one of Kian's brothers of the two of the Dan, and we know today as the uh, Dagda or the Doida, and uh, he's also known as one of the ancient harpers. And I'm trying to get up a, a picture so you've got a bit of a, a feel for who the Dagda is. Uh, let's try this one. Uh, well, that's sort of his harp. It's known as the Withner. Uh, Withner is, uh, I, sorry, I haven't got the spelling up, but it's supposed to be four-cornered, but that's the nearest artist's impression I could get to a Dagda harp. And uh, he was also known as the good god. Uh, that's his on a bowl uh, that I saw in the British Museum. I forget the origin of where that is. Um, also known as uh, Oliver, and also Ruud the Professor, and uh, the Red, the Mighty One of the Great Wisdom, those are various names uh, of the Jolly uh, Dagda there. And I think that was British Museum as well, even though it looks like someone's baked some bread. Anyway, the Dagda name, uh, as I hear it from Scottish mythology, is all bent from the Doida, uh, who's a kayak hag of conception and rebirth, very much like uh, is told of the Morrigan here. And... Uh, she uh, says she lives there in the Berg, and this is a painting. I actually lived for a while by that post, uh, by that telephone box there. There's some great stories of what happened there. That was my business phone for a while. <laughs> at the back there, you've got the uh, Berg, and then close up, uh, it has these lovely waterfalls, and in the wind, they blow up, and there's caves behind. I used to hold retreats, and we used to sleep overnight uh, behind in there. It's actually quite comfortable, uh, fascinating certainly at uh, one with the land for that. 
and there that's the place of the doida and i first heard of her within the berg as i say that's on the isle of mole uh, in the hebrides um but uh, when there's a storm uh, the story of the doida there when there's a storm and there's a sea swell it's said that the doida she comes out of the berg through the caves and uh, there's a storm because she's actually dancing on the caves, uh, dancing on the sea. And there's stories of uh, an ancient man who became enchanted by the doida. He wooed her, and it's with him she conceived the new life to be born in spring. So it's very similar to the Dagda and the Morrigan story that's familiar from about now until the grand midwinter conception. So the stories uh, get exchanged. It's amazing how they can seem. Now, with uh, Withner, the Dagda's harp, it's very unclear uh, what that actually translates out. And uh, I have heard an attempt uh, saying that it's, uh, it's called the Wood of Harmony. Uh, Withner, is, uh, that's a favorite. And uh, Dagda's harp is also known as the Door de Bloch. Um, and uh, that means roughly the oak of two blossoms. That's an artist's impression of the Dagda with his tour de Bloch. Uh, and sometimes uh, it's known as the Cori Ketha Cure or uh, Cori Ketha Cure, uh, the music and harmony of the four corners or the four cauldrons, uh, something in translation that's similar to a short version of the chakras. And uh, even... Um, there was a, a, a choir group uh, that was an Withna, and that was the original name of the Irish choir, Renuna. And so there's uh, them in their early days, and see they got the harp there because they had a very close association with the harp when they started off extremely, and that's probably a more recent one. So I often wonder if the old words of Cory or Cor or Coir uh, evolved into the word choir as there's a lovely bonded relationship between human harmonies uh, and harps. Now, near where I live, three kilometers away, two miles, is the hill of Keish. And uh, uh, Keish Korn, uh, there's the famous harper there, Korn, who's told of being the son of Dagder. And uh, I'm trying to find some pictures. I'm supposed to have a picture of Korn. Well, that's... An artist's impression of Koran. That's a real weird one. <laughs> I don't know where they got that idea, but that's uh, where it is. And I'm going to actually uh, move along and I'm going to change my backdrop because at this stage of the story, here's uh, just in case you haven't been there where the uh, Keish Caves are. Um, no, I, my transition is awful. Sorry about that. Uh, I've got them here and there they go. We'll have that for a little while as a sort of story source of of the caves that i will have that in my background there we go now some stories that uh have been told about Coran is, is he, he was the originator of the three strains of enchantment from the bards and these are the three trees and then more commonly uh said that uh, Dagda created them. So there's a dispute. Was it the Dagda? Was it son Koran? Uh, the originator of the three strains. Some even say Born uh, that Dagda had uh, a relationship with. But anyway, uh, it was taught to the sons and Koran in his heart, the son of Dagda, the originator of the three strains, three trays. I'm not going to talk about the deeds of Koran today, really, but the three strains I think is very important for today. And these being the gold tree, uh, which is the enchantment of sorrow and melancholy, weeping, and even keening. And then the jean tree, the enchantment of joy, happiness, and dancing. And then we've got uh, son tree, and I think I've got a son tree picture, the enchantment of sleep and uh, dreaming. So other ancient stories tell of the Doida or Dagda moving east to what's now Meath, and as I hinted, uh, where he wooed and mated with Boan or Boan and uh, of the Boin, and he enchanted her with his harp, of course. And I'm trying to get to my next picture. Um, and there's, there's an artist, I think that's Bowen. Yeah, there she is. There's a sort of a bronze of the Bowen there. And from this mating, oh, well, Bowen, it means white cow, just to bring that up, make that, go bring that up. There's Bowen, the white cow. And so it continues with Bowen having three sons that were fathered by 
the Doida by Dagda. And one story tells of Bowen's birthing going through three strains, that she had the cry of sorrow with the soreness of the pangs of childbirth, the cry of joy and the pleasure of the safe birth, and the calming cry of gratitude when the baby was fed, contented, and was sleeping. And there's another story of Bowen giving birth to the strains of enchantment, that each of the sons that she gave birth to via Dagda, uh, that they were named. Uh, so Gautry, he lived a life of sadness, and Jontre lived a life of joy, and Sontre, he lived a life of dreaming. So what happened to the best known of the son, Angus? Because um, he, he lived as an enchanter of love. And in Scottish stories, Angus was actually born to the bearer Brecon, who was the Fae Queen of Winter, another one like the um, uh, Doida, and another one like the uh, Morrigan. But uh, Bera Brecon, uh, her kind of home is Kilmartin, Isle of Jura, uh, also in Argyll, Era Gale. And Angus went on, this is a Scottish one, he went on to marry a Bridget. And they had a daughter that was also called Bridget. And, of course, both of those Bridges were born in spring. So they kind of tie up with the story, don't they, of the conception of midwinter and the birth at spring and being named after spring. But as for Coran the Harper, there's very few mythology stories about him. Perhaps the best one is the sow story. There's a nice big sow. And... Um, Ancient Sal. And there was also, uh, if I can get a, I remember the pronunciation, Gelcher, a huge Sal from the Boyne. And this is an artist's impression. Look at that one. Uh, and it said that he kept ravishing uh, all the crops at, uh, before the first harvest um, and came up all the way from the Boyne up to northwest, here, following where the N4 really is now, and jumped to the Shannon. There's, and eating everything up here, and of course, eating everything up, such a big sow, that it was ruining the harvest that people would starve for the winter. And um, so the, all the spears and all the arrows just couldn't bring this sow down. Uh, there's another story of uh, Deirdre, uh, who was actually of the Tour de Dan, and she ain't some... Uh, enchanted acorns. I think I got that. She ate the acorns and she turned into <laughs> this sow. That's another variation of that story. And she, it said that she ravaged the crops of Ireland. Anyway, uh, he arrived here and met up with Corrin and nobody, as I say, archers, spears, nothing could actually bring this sow down. And the entire summer crop was on the verge of being destroyed. Then, at the hill near where I live, there's Corrin with his harp. He was there. He had learned the three strains of enchantment. And as the sow approached, Corrin played the strain of sleep, the sauntry. And there the sow went to sleep. And uh, it said today, after the archers and spearmen managed to kill the sow when it was asleep and had that huge feast, some say the hill of Kesh is really, uh, that's behind me, uh, that's said to be the carcass uh, of that sow. And um, so uh, Coram was from that point said to be the teacher of the three strains and uh, taught the Harper Bar traditions and their skills that are still told. Similar today, although it's fading out, but uh, I've also heard that the Coram name as being a word for the constellation of Leo. And people in astrology, they see Leo, Leo the lion. But the sickle, a person with a sickle used to be the Leo sign. And of course, that's the first harvest sign because the first harvest uh, is in the middle of Leo. So there was a connection that Corin had something to do with that, uh, the cross quarter of Lunas of time. So I've also heard of... Uh, Corum being an older word for Rowan as well. Now, the um, there's the Carcass Hill in a diff. Look at that. that's the view from the tree labyrinth here. So you can see the idea of the carcass there. But right next to that, uh, there's actually um, some uh, little hills, and some people know these as the piglets. 
uh, you can see them right there. I think I've got a close-up one. Uh, you know, piglets, there you go, if you didn't know what piglets are. Uh, they're the piglets, the two hills coming up. No, they're not showing. There you go. There's the two piglet hills there that's beside it. Now, today's session about music, especially harps, uh, the Koran also has, or Kesh, uh, it's called Kesh Koran, the hill of Kesh, and that Kesh has some various interpretations. Uh, my favorite is the Menom one, where K means life, and um, being woman, and uh, Koran being of the Rowan, so you've got the woman of the Rowan carrying life, uh, being pre uh, pregnant. God, I'm losing it today, sorry. Uh, another translation is simply of it being the West. And today, uh, there's also another version that I actually learned from Leisha Kelly. And she understands the case being the harp with the deep bass tones. And if you go into the caves there, play a harp, you do get the deep uh, tones there as well. But anyway, I love that as uh, well. But not forgetting Keish Koran, the woman of the Rowan carrying life. I, uh, that's a favorite. Anyway, I'm going to get uh, go on to... Sorry, I'm losing it today. I don't know what's wrong with me, but we'll catch up in a minute. Claire will make up for it more than me. Anyway, good morning, uh, Anne Bowen was saying that. I think I've uh, got to that one. Good morning, Sharon Sherry. Uh, good morning, tuning in from Maryland, Terry Slack, Kimberly Kay's here. Good morning from Toronto, from Terra Lynn Fern, lovely to see you here. And then Elizabeth Hellman tuning in from uh, Virginia. Thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, now, there is uh, one legend that I love, and I'm going to move on. I was going to tell the King David and his harp one, but... Um, I'll, I'll probably do that as a video and put it in for the subscribers later on. Uh, it's a lovely story as well, King David and the Deravid and the transformation from the word there. But the one story I'd like to get on to is it's one that I picked up from a, a heart book. Um, I'm trying to see, uh, let's see if I can get the picture up of that one. Uh, yeah, it is uh, Annals of the Irish Harp. This is what we're doing. Uh, it's a story I picked up out of this fascinating one. Uh, it's, and it's a very funny one. Um, it's uh, Claire's got a book called The History of Irish Music. And a lot of these Annals of the Harpers is in it. And I took the story from this. And this must be both in the, the best record and legacy of harping in Ireland. And... Uh, the story of this was the time of Corwellyn, uh, Corwellyn up at Grefford. Uh, he was a prince in Wales. That's the only illustration I've got of him. And he was described as uh, trying to unite Wales in the same way that uh, high kings have been trying to unite Ireland for thousands of years. But Ireland was, uh, Wales was really where the Britons had been driven to uh, by the Romans and then the Saxons. And the Saxons were trying to form allegiances and taking over parts of Wales. But, uh, hang on, let's get back on this. But uh, this character, Coelin, he was trying to bring Wales together uh, to be a force against the Saxons. Didn't want Saxons to take over uh, the uh, Wales. They wanted to keep this whole bit of ancient Britain. And he formed a bit of a relationship with Dermot McMurrah, uh, King of Leinster, a uh, descendant of uh, Brian Baru. And uh, there's a thing you can read about Dermot there. And uh, this was during the 11th century, 10th century, 11th century. And he was invited to come to Wales because uh, the Welsh uh, wanted to form this allegiance. Uh, Corellian wanted to form an allegiance with him uh, to see if together they can push the Saxons away. And uh, so when uh, McMurra went over, uh, he bragged about the Harper tradition. When Dermot McMurra went over, he, he bragged about the Harper 
traditions of Ireland and how the traditions have brought Ireland together. Of course, he was bullshitting. And he was saying, every three years, we bring together all these harpers to a fish, a fish at Tara. And this was where differences were settled, and that's how you could unite all of Ireland. And when all the differences were settled, the whole island honored the high king and all the harpers would come together with the stories from their regions and everybody be united. Of course, this was all BS that, that McMurray was saying because he had nothing to do with it. It was a different high king uh, that was involved in this. Anyway, the Feast of Terror had ended 532 AD. So there wasn't any Feast of Terror going on in the 10th century. Uh, 532, Columkeel had been tried and sent off to what's now Scotland. He landed on Iona, a famous story there. And so since that time, Ireland had actually been very untogether for 500 years since Columkeel had gone off. But Corwellian of Wales was very impressed with this idea of a unifying Harper Bar tradition. So he asked Dermot, could he attend the next Grand Feast of Ireland? Could he come over and see how this worked? So uh, oh, he put he put himself into the poo poo there, I suppose. And uh, so he thought if he could see the fish going on in Ireland, he might be able to include these Irish bards over in an equivalent in Wales in the future. Uh, there was obviously a trade deal trying to be encouraged between what was Wales and Ireland then, as well as this allegiance to push the Saxons. So McMurrah realized that in order to keep up with this BS they've been saying, he had to enact the ancient feast that used to be at Tara so that he could impress Corellin. So he went back uh, to Leinster and uh, they, uh, he, he kind of went around the lands people. And of course, these people, they, they, they weren't playing harps. He just went around and said, look, you know, all you have to do is learn these enchanting strains and prophecy. And he went uh, around the Glendalock area and he ordered peasants from County Wicklow to quickly work out how to get a tune out of a cruet harp, small harp, and make up some words of prophecy. So this was all put together very quickly. Unfortunately, um, the old Irish and Welsh languages were quite different. So they could get away with it through the language differences and they could assume prophecy words because they, they thought other oh, Welsh wouldn't understand a word they're saying. So these prophecies could be BS as well. So really they were just picking up these farmers, picking up a harp, bing, 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 how to work a string or two. And uh, anyway, they had this big feature at Glenlock with all these farmers that had never touched a, a harp a few months before. And... Uh, he, of course, McMurray had to convince Corellin why the fish had been moved from Tara to Glendalough, and he managed to do that successfully. Anyway, he told Corellin that these Harper bards, uh, though they'd only been touching harps for a few weeks, he told them that they were the, the top, finest Harper bards in the whole of Ireland who had traveled to the Glenglock fish from all four corners of Arian. And, and that's a picture of a Glendalough, <laughs> of a Wicklow Harper that came along. But the actual high king of Tara at the time was Turlock McConnor. And he hadn't got a clue what was going on. He was a former king of Connell. Uh, and he was kept right out of the loop of this, what was going on in Glendalough. Anyway, Mamara was covertly looking to get the Welsh support, as I said, to help him, uh, not only with the allegiance with Wales, uh, in exchange for that allegiance with Wales, he wanted the Welsh to actually help him push the High King out so he would become the next High King of Ireland, push Connor out. He wanted to be the next king. So this was this double thing that was going on. Fortunately, Crowellyn, he did arrive in Wicklow, he did arrive in Glendalough, and he was actually very impressed with these novice Harper bards that hadn't even touched a harp a week or two before. And he did believe, Corelli believed, that they were the finest Harper's Bards in the whole of Erin, in the whole of Ireland. And so Quellin said, look, come over to Wales and put up a similar feast here and teach the Welsh people how to become the finest Harper Bards like they are too. So by doing so, uh, Corelli actually uh, 
there's all the different tribal areas of uh, ancient Wales. He got them all together. He got them into a grand fish. And um, with the unity of Wales, they managed, and with some help from Leinster, uh, they were all ready to drive the Britain, uh, as Britons, drive the Saxons away from any idea of taking over Wales. And uh, I don't know what the trade deal was. Maybe it was uh, an exchange of leaks for harps. I don't know. But those quick learning harper bards from Ireland, they only got to do one huge face, unfortunately, because the Normans arrived. They took over. They took over Wales. They, there was no follow-up fish gatherings. They were all gone for a while. And because the Normans were successful, uh, Dermot kind of changed tune. And rather than get together with the uh, the Welsh, he got together with the Normans. And this is a lot of people know the story of how the Normans helped Dermot get the high kingship. And uh, Strongbow married uh, Dermot's daughter, Aoife. That was all part of the deal as well later on. And I had a picture of Aoife, but I don't know where he's gone. There we go. There we uh, No, that's the deal with the Normans. There's Aoife. And, there's a, and that's what happened at the reception afterwards. Well, eventually it will come up. There you go. And that's the marriage of Dermot's daughter, Aoife, to Strongbow. So the Normans then, as we know, became more Irish than the Irish and a whole new history chapter in Ireland. But what's little known is that uh, attempted allegiance with the novice Harper Bards that were, uh, they were very impressive. And uh, there's the, the crowd, there's Dermot Mamura with his axe there. And there's Aoife and there's Rory O'Connor, the High King that got booted off <laughs> and Dermot took over. But uh, I think that's a noble one. And uh, the reason I mention that is that the whole subject here and what Claire's going to be talking about is that anybody uh, in Ireland, they can pick up a harp, play a few strings uh, to bring with their words, and they can be one of the finest harpers, harper bards in Ireland or wherever you live. So um, that's, uh, I'm going to be passing you over to Claire Roach, who will show you exactly how to do this, like these Irish uh, peasant farmers, and uh, you can do this too. Let's see what you're saying uh, about this. <laughs> tuning in, there's people still tuning in. Uh, we've got um, Toronto, Canada, Terra Lynn Ferns here, Candice Rainbow, uh, Owl is here. Okay, now what we've got to do, as I'm not really linked up, uh, for multi cameras and uh, microphones, that'll be the pledge drive for next year. Uh, we've got to improvise with this one microphone and uh, camera. So I'm going to change round, and you'll be seeing Claire in this seat in a few minutes. And whilst we do that and rearrange the furniture, I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, Claire to come up with. Oh, Cynthia Willis is here. Oh, of course she is. <laughs> Lovely to see you, Cynthia. There you go. So good to see you. Lovely that you can manage to tune in. Uh, that's gorgeous. Uh, so anyway, Claire, we're going to do this setting up, and uh, we'll be back in a few minutes after Claire's symbolic, and hopefully we'll be set up and Claire will be in this chair for you. Here we go.
the human loneliness He says with a sigh Things are not right And he Have Claire there. <laughs> there you go. And Claire Roach uh, got the similar background. I'm going to uh, change. I don't know if you hear me. She's got the mic. As I say, we're on single mic. So you're probably hearing me uh, from the difference. I'm going to give her a more appropriate green screen uh, for uh, Claire's situation because she loves the horses. So there we are uh, with the horses. Actually, let's give one of Woodford. There we go. We've got her in the Woodford garden setting. So hello, Claire. Say hello to everyone who's available. <laughs> hello, everybody. And hello, Cynthia. Gosh, I have a lovely memory of you singing in Cromlick Lodge. Um, what a beautiful lady. And thank you all. I'm delighted to meet you. Um, I wish we could meet in person. Oh, that's brilliant. And as I say, I brought uh, Claire on for that reason where I was talking about uh, that kind of bringing the fish to Wales. And, um, you know, the, the whole point of this talked about last week uh, about how being a bard, just allowing your words to just come out, jot them down, put them together in your journal, and then put them from your journal into just native poetry. Don't think about the grammar and the structure. Just get those words out there. And I was... Uh, when I first knew Claire, we were clearing out her father's house and there was reel-to-reels and there was uh, cassettes and put them on. It was amazing to hear Claire uh, as a teenager and later on. And there was all this sort of, you might say, and try not to be rude, but this all gobbledygook <laughs> that she was just letting words come out. Yes. Uh, she had the harp and she was just going, plink, 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 that'll fit the words. And... Um, and th it was amazing how it was structured. And it's one that Claire asked to play. Sitting in Greenfield was a lovely example of that. That just turned out, uh, it was just a fantasy. Words out of the head, you know, go with the words and go with uh, the harp. So what I'd like, uh, we've got the folk harp there with Claire. We've got the, the concert harp later. But the folk harp is something any of you could possibly go for. You could go for Derman harps and get one uh, very cheaply if you choose to go with a harp to go with your words. So, Claire, t uh, tell us a bit about that, um, the way you go about that uh, songwriting in your own words. I made the description that it just seems as you just got stuff out of air, and then you just, you don't even think about uh, the structure of, you know, uh, of harps. You, you don't reach for a harp book. That's what I'm trying to say. Well, John, you're so kind. And I remember you once saying to me, Claire, it's not the harp playing, it's the passion behind the harp playing. And I was really delighted with that because um, I didn't really study the harp. And of course, I had to run the gauntlet of, oh, well, you're not traditional and you're not concert harp and you're not this or that. And I remember saying that to an audience and a man said, and you're not worried. So, um, I, I suppose you, I, I love literature, and that's what I studied. And one of my favorite phrases about this very thing, and I hope it will relate to you, 
is that James Joyce spoke about writing and he said it was forged from the smithy of his soul. So as John would say, I would go in to a, a room in my father's house, my mother and father's house, and there is a beautiful piano, which I still have. And I'd turn on, the, I'd, I'd be in a certain mood, you see, a, 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 maybe a celebration. Funnily enough, the three strains, I might be in a joyful mood, a kind of a quiet meditative mood or else uh, maybe melancholy. And I would just sit down and turn on the reel to reel. And to be honest with you, um, songs would come and um, they would just come almost perfectly formed. And I and I, I remember Bono saying, um, we're not particularly clever, but it has to be magic. And I know my limitations. I might have had very few chords in my repertoire, a very small knowledge, say, of the piano or of the harp. But once you have the basic ingredients of chords, um, you can just take off. You, you, you can play them upside down and inside out and from back to front and upside down. Uh, well, and, you know, maybe I should demonstrate. So to get back to um, what I would do in the, the room, I'd just start with a, a chord um, and, then, and then I might elaborate. And then the words would come. Now, one of the loveliest things that happened to me in 2018, I found a perfect song. Well, in when I say a perfect song, uh, in I hope it was perfect, but that was recorded 45 years ago. And um, I re-recorded it, of course, to get a better texture. But um, it, as I say, it's from deep within. You're in a frame of mind. And I always want to say to people, it's the emotion, it's the thought, it's the colour, it's the painting. And of course, I would have loved perhaps to have studied the concert harp and the, the Irish harp and to be, to be a virtuoso. But I went with what I had, which was quite a small number of chords. And then I just made it up, as John said about the Welsh Harp Festival, as I went along. And, you know, in school, we would have been taught maybe these three chords, or this three, let's see. And I mean, you could just take off on that. And then I, I like um, using different, uh, just pushing out one finger, you know, from, that's one chord. But then if you put two, two together in the middle, you get that. So it's like your springboard and, I always think of the harp um, because it's so close to you. It's very like nestling against a horse's head. And it's like the beginning of an adventure. Or else the concert harp is much, is much my, like a boat, a, a sailboat. So the minute you put your hands on the strings and all the music is hidden in there and it just takes thought, imagination, excitement to bring it out. And do you know what I must say to you? One of the most beautiful performances I ever saw was when John led a tour to Bridget Garden in County Galway. And a young lady shyly came in. She was from Germany. And she said, would you mind if I touched your harp? She'd broken away from the tour. Uh, or, and um, she did a whole performance on C, just C. And, and uh, you'll see from the harp that uh, the sea is our red. But it was so moving. And I thought there's an exquisite, uh, an exquisite example of simplicity and gentleness. Um, but, uh, but anyway, John, I'm going on too long as usual. Now, one thing uh, you reminded me, which is something I saw on a Paul McCartney documentary, something similar, uh, because someone came up to him and, and uh, said, Oh, how do you play the piano? And he said, well, none of us Beatles know how to write music. We never have done. And in fact, we didn't have digital devices. We had to keep stuff in our heads mm -hmm. to remember and remind each other, how does that go? Yes. Uh, but he said, it's very simple. He says, the piano is simple. He said, look at this. He puts three fingers down, plays the C, 
And he says, look what happens when you take those three fingers and nose up. Ding, ding. Yes. And he was just doing the same. Uh, he said, look, you know, and as he was doing that, Paul was doing that, he had a verse come to his head. And the person said, look, that's all you need. And you can put a song together. Mm -hmm. And so that person went away and, and practiced that. Paul carried on and he wrote, let it be with those three chords. Yeah, and it's, <laughs> it just it's funny, you. you know, when you say like that, once you have the chord shape, once your teacher gives you the chord shape, you know, you can go up like this. And you can come. Of course, Paul McCartney is some genius. And you can split the chords. And of course, um, you know, it. there are endless possibilities. But I would... I would say to people, getting a teacher is a wonderful thing because it is difficult to teach yourself. Um, they're the grounding. Of course, if they're not kindly, uh, I always say drop them. Um, I had a teacher once. <laughs> I had three fabulous ones. No, two fabulous ones. The one in the middle was a bit crotchety. And uh, I'd be nervous. And... Uh, she'd say, well, now you're ruining the harp because my hands would get warm. So that wasn't a good experience. But the other ones were fantastic, especially my last one, because she would broaden out what you could do. Things, you know, like doing that in the middle of the song um, and, and rhythm. I mean, that's just, as you say, just going up and down. And But she would have taught me different chord uh, what's the word, uh, different chord positions. And then that's your, that's like baking scones. Yeah. You have your flour, your, you have all the ingredients. Why well, I was relating to with yourself, because I obviously was flashing through the stories uh, of uh, Kian there and then on to uh, Dagda and then on to Corin. With all of those, they wouldn't have had music teachers. Uh, they wouldn't have even had scales. Yeah, they had a piece of wood. They had some string. And they manage to enchant with that. Yes. And that's the thing is, is don't be, uh, allow yourself to be suppressed because, oh, no, I, I don't know. I haven't reached scale one and scale two on musicians. I don't know how to read and write. It's uh, having that confidence that you've got words. doesn't matter what makes the sound. You'll find by applying the sound from the words, you'll be able to have techniques uh, in your tune that fits the words, and you'll be putting together chords that are perhaps not even in music books. Yes. And other harpists will be saying, how do you do that? Again, the Beatles thing, the challenge with every guitarist is how the hell do you pay that first chord in Ticket to Ride? No guitarist has managed to play that first chord in Ticket to Ride. And a harpist can, on anybody in a whistle, or may have a technique. Well, this sound fits my words and mm -hmm. uh, that i think is the key point uh, that i'm trying to put across today is don't be intimidated by the instrument mm -hmm. let the instrument flow with your words and that's to me the enchantment of the bard well yes because they come together and i i love saying this to people who have had difficulty say learning uh, because I first set the uh, poem by W. B. Yeats to music when I found it very hard to learn the poem in school. So I just sat down and, and looked at the words and, and just, you know, uh, explored everything. And then the next thing it was in my mind. And, um, you know, I can read music and it's a wonderful help to read music. But by, by, I find it so much helpful to hear by ear. And as you say, um, I can, re you know, it's in your ear. And when I'd have a phrase, a beautiful, beautiful phrase, say, from a poem, it would be in my mind night and day. And then the, the music would just come. But do you know what I must say? I really admire, oh, my goodness. And that's why they're so famous. Songwriters who sit down and they say, I'm going to write a song. Now, that has never, ever happened to me. The songs just arrive. But, of course, they're in number one chart. Uh, are, are these incredible um, music students that I've met that are writing symphonies on paper. I mean, the gift of that. But I understand that, that I haven't got that gift. So I work with what I have. And um, to be honest, it, it's not, it's no point 
being in a vacuum. Um, and when I started the harp again at age 36, my whole question was, look, I feel this. And do you feel this too? So, you know, it's all, this is the thing that uh, it has to be shared. Now, uh, the one I mentioned about is uh, picking up through the cassettes <clears throat> and that the sitting in the greenfield. I wonder if you can share that one because that is the, that's the closest to what we've, I've been talking about. You just, it, you have the words uh, that you mumbled out and then you put the tune to it. And then later you crafted the words a bit further. But it was just such an organic creation. Well, thank you very much, John. And I mean, that that's about, I think I was 18. And I know that it's incredible to think that that's so long ago. Mm -hmm. But the feeling has still is still with me. And of course, um, the phrases are essential uh, that you're trying to get away uh, into the exquisite nature, but um, you understand that you have to come back again. So perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll share this and I hope that you're Listeners like it. happens when you you find some words some basic words and you put some tune to it you go back to your words and you craft it and over the years 
it becomes that uh, creation. So uh, thank you for that, Claire. <laughs> Please uh, quickly put some questions in about uh, to Claire about the idea of your words, putting your words with some music. It's amazing that obviously sitting in a greenfield, if Claire uh, just gave you the words, that's beautiful in its way. But think of that enchantment of the heart and and where that took you. And where did that actually take take you? Were there any memories you had when you heard that song? Did you did you find, feel the enchantment uh, of that? And uh, we've got uh, Anne Bolden, uh, uh, very beautiful. And, uh, and of course, Cynthia, number one fan <laughs> there. It's <laughs> lovely. Uh, she enjoyed that. Uh, but it would bring back memories from when we used to visit Cynthia there in South uh, Carolina. Uh, beautiful memories as well. And the lovely stage show uh, was fantastic. And Elisa's here. Beautiful morning, yes, this morning, Claire. About any questions yourself, uh, because you must be writers. Um, don't be shy now. <laughs> and uh, uh, with uh, what are you putting together? The idea of putting some music. How are you going to put a tune to perhaps words you got? You can even use uh, a drum, of course. Uh, you can use a borum, a borum, for instance. Uh, or even um, uh, a Tibetan bowl uh, or a crystal bowl and just the rim of that. Uh, you can use little symbols. Uh, you can get a few notes out of a whistle. Or you can get yourself a wee harp. And as Claire was saying, just find out where the C is. And if you found three Cs, just do a tune around that. And it's amazing what will build up. But that is what uh, we're uh, – that's the, really the point of today is uh, there's no such thing as a novice. You've got that enchantment in your soul, no matter what your abilities are. So any questions uh, before we we kind of move on uh, with this uh, wonderful session? It's uh, been a delight to have Claire actually in the studio here, changing <laughs> the background there and, and doing the change around in a very primitive way, as you saw. <laughs> and uh, we'll be changing back in a second. So anything else you would like to ask? Uh, uh, all you lovely people out there in nature folklore land. Nature. Anyway, so I think we'll change over. I've still got a bit more uh, to share with you. So thank you very much, uh, that uh, Claire. And we've got another one of Claire. Claire also plays the piano. And uh, Chesterfield will talk about where uh, Claire gets a lot of her uh, improvisation. And uh, there's a pond there. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so this is Claire on piano, even though this is supposed to be half. Again, it's like that McCartney thing I was saying. is uh, just simple notes on a piano, and this is what will happen. And then we'll put this on where we'll change things around again. Thank you very much, Claire. That was beautiful. There we go. Oops, there it is. Chesterfield Park. 
back hello there uh, it's me here not clear this time but uh, thank you very much for your comments uh, cynthia is going to get her art repaired and started back um uh, been inspired and then we've got uh, terry slack uh, hardwick uh, beautiful gift uh, graced uh, by claire there and uh, so uh, yeah thanks for that i've got the wrong glasses on uh these, these are much better for catching you up with and sergeant parker's appeared uh, enchanting loved you both uh, thanks very much to say we had to improvise there because i'm working on one mic and one uh camera and uh one thing that i hope we'll uh, get to fund uh very soon of course is uh to be able to do uh multiple mics and cameras and of course that's uh, with a remind the help of you wonderful uh, subscribers. It's just a euro, dollar, or pound a month. Uh, there it goes. Patreon.com uh, Woodland Bard is the place for that. So thank you, subscribers. That helps this along, and that's the next thing we're doing. Now, as I say, this is a three-part series. Uh, the first one, we went into the uh, journaling and native poetry and uh, this time communicating the idea of how to make your words enchanting because words are so limited and you might need another vehicle and the music is a very good one. So I hope that message came across. Now, next week it's going to be uh, uh, part three is going to discuss scribing because even last week uh, people, though I was saying about improvising, people wanted to look up tutor books and and they wanted to read things about how to apply uh, the music so um i'm trying to get up to my pictures on this so we've got the part three we're going to be talking about the scribes and uh how they did things um there we go why have i got that one up uh, no i'm on the wrong page here we go that's it so oh it's, I'm going to go to the Oum and the stories I heard from Iona and the idea of the Oum language being prompts. I should have had a proper picture of some Oum symbols rather than the trees. But the trees were prompts. So we're going to talk about how scribing started as prompts. And just like the way when you've got your journal, if you started journaling when you were a child, you probably did little doodles and uh, little drawings. And I'm going to talk about Ohm on that level as well and how that developed into scribing and how eventually you can craft all the words of the music that you can eventually craft that, but also talk about that change. So that's parting part three. It's a conclusion, and it's going to be talking about prompts uh, 
as well as how to craft what you do. So that'll be a conclusion. And that's uh, what's the date of that next week? Um, we're going to be talking about how scribing changed. That was the thir- is that thirtieth, twenty eighth, isn't it? Yeah, twenty eighth. That's next week. Then the fifth of December. Uh, starting a four-part Yule season series. And the first one, and that's why I put this back cloth here, is the mischief one. Uh, we're doing uh, mischief and mystery as part one. All kinds of stuff on that one. Uh, the intent with that week is to share uh, less familiar observances in December. Uh, the gratitudes, the celebrations, the recognitions, and how this done uh, is going to be winter tree traditions, caroling, mumming, folk drama, all kinds of stuff uh, where people used to have fun and games, but it's kind of been watered down uh, to things like Black Friday and head off to the, the store, the multi-store. You know, we're going to be talking about what happened. That's on uh, before all that stuff, when communities did stuff uh, together. So that's 5th of December, part one. And um, I talked about mumming, very different to how mumming is done in USA and Newfoundland. Uh, this is very local. Then on the 12th of December, we'll move on to uh, part two. And this is going to be the return of reindeer folklore. People love this one when did it last December. So bringing that back again with one or two new stories. And that's on the 12th. And uh, it's a topic of folklore that's grown in, in, in popularity. Probably in the last 10 years, people have really taken to this uh, reindeer and any deer uh, folklore. And I'm going to be sharing stories, inspirations, uh, uh, such as Ocean the Bard, and we mentioned him a little bit earlier as being a son of uh, Bowen and Dagda. Ellen the Deer Goddess, we're going to bring her, of course, and there'll be other uh, deer-related tales. And then 19th of uh, December, that's part three of this Yule Season series, and we'll be going to the whole log thing, and this is fascinating in its own right. That's 19th of December, uh, all the background to Yule Logs and related tales to that. Uh, but And there's a part four, as I said, but that's going to be after Christmas Day. So I think I'll tell you more about that one when we get closer to the time. So uh, before we uh, go, uh, let's see what uh, your anything else you're saying. Any questions, any comments? Uh, because uh, almost at the end of the show today, as usual, I've ran over time. Not so serious over time as usual. So thanks again uh, to the amazing uh, guests uh, today. The guest of the day, Claire Roach. Fantastic to get her onto a session today. That was great. And um, I, anybody who's watching this as an archive, do uh, make your comments. I do return to this from time to time through the weeks to answer the late comments. So do make your comments. Subscribe below. Uh, there's a bell, especially to the YouTube people. YouTube people have been watching today, and that'll remind you of what's coming up the next week. So it's uh, down to me to uh, thank you all for being uh, wonderful people joining in and joining in uh, with Claire there and your uh, lovely comments. So enjoy a very uh, safe week, and I hope it's going to be full of lots of uh, inspirations for you and lots of enchantments. I uh, hope you move forward making sounds with things, even if you haven't done that before. Uh, someone's come up uh, with a comment here. Uh, there's uh, music and blessings to all, uh, says Sandra, which is lovely. Thank you very much for being on board uh, this afternoon or morning with you, Sandra. So enjoy that uh, wonderful week that's ahead of you. And I uh, hope it's all kind to you. Thanks very much. That was a beautiful time. Thank you. See you next week, I hope. Bye. Bye.